Um, I'm Kathy Gorley, and I'm a member of Friends of Restorative Justice of Washington County. And that organization, along with the Dispute Resolution Center, is presenting this uh, workshop about restorative justice, in particular in Washtenaw County. And I'm going to um, introduce the speakers and keep them on time, and also, um, at first, introduce the two different organizations, explain the, the history of, of where we're coming from. So, um, some years ago, uh, a couple named Stan and Jan Reedy moved here from Indiana, and then their house was broken into and things were stolen. Uh, the young thief was eventually apprehended and the Reedies told the police that they wanted to do a restorative justice conference with the thief. This was something that was done in Indiana and um, so they asked for it. They thought it was a better system and the, uh, they were told, no, we don't do that here. So they weren't able to um, have some kind of resolution with the thief. However, they didn't give up. They decided to work to bring restorative justice to Washtenaw County. Uh, they did this along with other members of their church, Shalom Community Church, which is a Mennonite and Church of the Brethren congregation here in Ann Arbor. As you know, these denominations place a high value on peace and reconciliation. One of the things they did was encourage showings of a play called Tough Case. This professionally written and entertaining play demonstrates a restorative justice conference between a teenage vandal and an elderly widow. This play has now been shown at several churches and a library in the area, and two more showings are scheduled in, in the next couple months. Meanwhile, another group called Healing Communities was getting interested in restorative justice. Its members are from the various religious communities in the area who want to make their congregations more helpful to people who have been hurt by crime and hurt by incarceration. They were attracted to the idea that restorative justice tries to heal the harm caused by crime rather than just punishing. These two groups discovered each other and some of the members began working together under the name Friends of Restorative Justice of Washtenaw County. Meanwhile, a third related organization in Washtenaw County, the Dispute Resolution Center, was in operation. This organization has been officially formed by the state of Michigan to resolve disputes using mediation. Mediation can be used as an alternative to civil court that saves money and results in a better resolution. As Belinda Doolin, the, exec the executive director of the Dispute Resolution Center of Washtenaw Livingston Counties, learn more about restorative justice, she realized that like mediation, it is a tool that can be used to resolve conflict in a peaceful and satisfactory way. The Dispute Resolution Center got into doing restorative justice circles when asked to by Judge Timothy Connors of the Washtenaw Juvenile Court. Soon, members of the Friends of Restorative Justice were asking the Dispute Resolution Center to train them in how to facilitate these circles. Now the members of all three of these groups are working together to increase the use of restorative justice practices in areas, courts, and schools. Stan and Jan Reedy have now moved on to Washington, D.C., but their dream of restorative justice conferences in Washtenaw County is alive and getting closer to reality. Okay, next, I would like to introduce Mary King, who will speak. She is the Executive Director of the Michigan Council on Crime and Delinquency, and the former director of the Michigan Prisoner Reentry Program in Washtenaw and Livingston Counties. She will explain what restorative justice is and contrast it with our current punitive justice system. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So it turns out that most of the time, when someone has been a victim of a crime, or the victim of some other kind of harm, that they have similar questions and they have similar needs. And those similar questions and similar needs are usually something like this. Can you hear me better? Excellent. So those questions and needs are, why did that person or persons commit the crime or cause the harm to me? Is that person sorry? Do they feel remorse? And what is that person or person is doing now to make sure that it will never happen again? Unfortunately, 
with our current criminal justice system, those are not the questions that get asked or answered. Restorative justice is a community-based approach to dealing with crime, dealing with the effects of crime, and dealing with the prevention of crime. Most of the people who move through the criminal justice system don't find that to be a healing or a satisfying experience, and that goes for both victims and people who commit the crimes. In fact, a lot of times victims feel re-victimized by the criminal justice system. I see some head nodding here. That's because they may not ever really learn why they were the target of that particular crime, what was going on with the person at the time that the harm was caused. They never really know if the person took responsibility for their actions, and they certainly don't know if there's any assurances that that will happen again. In addition to that, for people who have committed crimes or caused a harm and their families, they often leave that justice system feeling even more broken and more likely that those kinds of events can happen again. And I remember a symposium that I was at several years ago, and I believe it was someone from the audience actually, and not on the panel, who said something that I've never forgotten. I thought it was incredibly wise. And what he said was that for people who have committed crimes, who are engaged with the criminal justice system, that they often feel so victimized by that system because of bias, because of over-punishment for their crime, because of the conditions that they experience in confinement if they are incarcerated, they feel so victimized by the system that it keeps them from being able to feel empathy towards their own victims. They're so focused on their own feelings that they can't sit back for a minute and experience what it would be like for the person who was at the other end of their crime. And I thought those were really wise words. A restorative justice process operates from the belief that the path to justice lies with problem solving and with healing <coughs> rather than punitive isolation, which is what people experience when they go to jail or prison. And so in order to appreciate the differences in the approach between retributive or punitive justice versus restorative justice, I think it's first important to understand that in the U.S., the criminal justice system operates, of course, under this retrip, re, it's a very difficult word to say, it turns out. So I'm going to say punitive yeah. justice system. Um, and that is based on this theory that the state is the ultimate victim of the crime. And so therefore, the state has the power to punish the people that it deems criminal. It's also one of the reasons why there is so much punishment for victimless crimes, like such as drug offenses, and people, where people get treated really harshly, but in fact, um, there is not a, a person who's a victim. The victim is considered the state. The differences between punitive justice and restorative justice break down in a number of ways. One is, as I said, in the punitive system, Crime is an act against the state. In restorative justice, it's an act against a person or an act against the community. In the criminal justice system, they are the ones who control the outcomes of the crime. In restorative justice, it's actually the crime control lies within the community. In a punitive system, accountability is always defined as punishment. Whereas in a restorative system, punishment alone is not ever thought to be effective. That it has to be coupled with repair to the disruption of the community harmony, repair to the disrupt disruption of relationships. In a punitive justice system, victims are actually kind of peripheral to the system. That's not true in restorative justice. In the punitive justice system, the relationships are adversarial. There's a winner, there's a loser, there's a right, there's a wrong, there's a criminal, there's a victim. That's not true in restorative justice, where it's about dialogue, relationship, 
negotiation, healing. In a restorative justice process, the victims take an active role in the process. And I think it's really important to be talking about the role of victims in restorative justice because restorative justice has often been unfairly painted as a way that we're letting criminals off the hook, as opposed to, this is really very much of a victim-centered approach, but it also recognizes that the, that the cause of that harm may be much bigger or much more global than we could ever have dreamed. That it's not just the person who has received the harm from that particular act that's been victimized, but often the person who perpetrated that act has been a victim for many, many years, too. One of the things that's very different uh, has to do with the guiding questions that get asked between the two systems. So the first question the traditional criminal justice system asks, what laws have been broken, who did it, and what does that person deserve? And restorative justice, what gets asked is, who's been hurt? What are their needs? Whose obligation is it to meet those needs? What were the causes of the harm? Who are all of the people that have a stake in that? And then what is the appropriate process to involve so that that harm can be put right? Thank you. Next we'll hear from Gertrude Warkenton from Shalom Community Church. I have two abbreviated stories, and one was um, Kathy alluded to when Stan and Janet Reedy's house was broken into. Now they had long been proponents of restorative justice and wished so much to be able to sit down. And as Kathy said, they were unable to, but what they did was consult with a victim win witness advocate and decided to prepare a statement to read at the sentencing. They did so, and they asked the offender to think about how the actions had impacted their lives, how violated they felt, the questions that haunt them. They also expressed their hope that the teenager would find high school, would finish high school, and become a contributed member, contributing member of society, that he not allow this destructive act to determine the course of his life. The judge then sentences the young man and asks if he has anything to say. The young man turns to the couple, turned to Stan and Janet, and apologized, told them that, they had, that it was nothing personal, that, they had not, that it was just random. Stan and Janet, who had watched the sentencing after sentencing, over the course of that day, noted that their offender was the first to apologize. Mm. They were also the only victims who had read an impact statement. During this statement, they also expressed their desire to see Washtenaw County establish a victim offender conferencing program, a system that would have allowed them to meet with a trained facilitator, the teenager and his mother, where they could um, both all speak their mind and uh, engage together in crafting a plan. One more brief story. In 1974, Elmira, Ontario, two young men, 17, 19, 18, 19 years old, vandalized some 22 homes and, and businesses. Before the hearing, the parole officer and his assistant wondered if there was not a better way to hold offenders more fully accountable than the usual court hearings and the sentencing. They asked the judge to assign the young men to them so that they could take them to face the owners of the property and to offer to make things right. The judge shook his head. There's no precedent for that, he said. And then he did it. That's my favorite part. <laughs> the offenders agreed to go with the PO and his assistant to face the people they had offended. They knocked on all the doors, acknowledged what they had done, apologized, asked for forgiveness, and offered to pay for the damages. 
Some of the folks were right ready to forgive, others less so, but in the end they all agreed and plans for repayment were made. The offenders repaid their debt over a period of several months and were on probation for a year and a half. The folks whose places had been vandalized expressed a good deal of satisfaction with the whole process. They were relieved to know that they had not been targeted, and they could see that these young men were not monsters. So what is a community to do in the face of this kind of experiment, this evidence? It seemed to have been for the benefit of the victim and the offenders, and most probably <coughs> had made the community somewhat safer. What the community did was to establish a community justice initiative providing a structure and process for restorative approaches such as victim offender conferencing. An approach that does give offenders the opportunity to take full responsibility for damage they had done and the victims to continue to the opportunity to be heard and to have direct involvement as you mentioned. This was the first such program in North America, 1974. The first in this country was in 1978, which is the Center of Community Justice in Elkhart, Indiana. Now, Washtenaw County is not devoid of restorative practices, and there is a great deal of room left to develop such practices as victim offender conferencing. hear from Belinda Doolin, the Executive Director of the Dispute Resolution Center. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so my part of this will be focused on schools. <clears throat> you know, um, follow um, the storytelling and just share um, a real story from a real school here locally in our county. Um, in 2012, September 2012, um, the Dispute Resolution Center was invited to Ypsilanti High School to work um, with the students and the staff to create a peer mediation program and start putting some building blocks in place for a restorative practice process. Um, so early in the school year in September, I had about 20 students, 22 students who um, were selected to be peer mediators. So my background is mediation, and I have been doing it for a while, training people for a while, and now I'm beginning to train students to do what we've been training adults to do for many years. One of the students in a class was challenging. She was, um, the student was sort of on the fence of at risk. We didn't know which way she would go. There was a lot of question about including her in the peer mediation group. Uh, my philosophy is that I didn't want um, a sports team. I don't want all of the honor students, all of the athletes, all of the anything. A peer mediation group needs to reflect um, the diversity of the school. So we were very careful in whom we selected um, and understanding we had some limits on how many students can be in there. So one of this particular student was quite challenging. Um, if you have ever trained or been in a training class, one of your nightmares is that person in your class who's going to challenge everything you say, uh, have sidebar conversations, uh, giggle at you, and all of those things. All of those things happen in the training. But there was something unique about this young student that I was able to see. Um, clearly, the student was a leader. And it felt that my responsibility, to coin the phrase of uh, Janelle, who's been helping uh, with this, we had to help her see and use her superpowers for good. Yes. So um, every chance I get, every break I get, I have a sidebar with her, ask her to calm down, join me in the training, take a part, because she could get the kids to listen to her <laughs> much better than I could at times, especially after we ate pizza for lunch. So she was really, really helpful. Fast forward to about January of that same school year. This student was known as a troublemaker. Uh, the student had less than a 1.0 grade point average. The student was skip, was skip class, was known as a bad attitude. Teachers did not like to see her coming sometimes. True story. 
Um, one day in the hallway in January, um, a teacher was having a negative interaction with another student. And this particular girl, um, I can't say her name due to confidentiality, so bear with me. She saw this interaction in the hall, became very, for some reason, became very excited about it, and she jumped into it. And she just sort of berated the teacher. She was threatening, intimidating in behavior. Uh, this is according to the written report. Um, the teacher became overwhelmed and intimidated by her. The resource officer, um, which are, uh, I guess, a nice word for uh, police security in our schools, um, actually handcuffed her, put her into a squad car, and took her over to the door called the Sally Port, which is juvenile detention. It's a secret door that goes up, the car pulls in, uh, the, the youth is taken out of the car, and they go into a processing office. This is where they do intake and kind of get you ready for your life in juvenile detention. So she, in, in effect, she was arrested while in school, handcuffed, taken to the car, um, and her head was pushed down to get into the squad car because she had been insubordinate, berated her teacher, intimidated the staff, and they couldn't get her back under control. While in detention, and she spent probably about 45 days in detention, so that's quite a bit of time of school that she missed. But while there, she wrote a three, four page letter about conflict resolution. And she noted many of the things she had heard in the peer mediation training in September. She had noted a number of things about herself, her insight. She understood she had management, anger management issues. She understood that uh, she should behave better. She took responsibility for her behavior. She corrected herself in this letter. She sent the letter to the principal of the school. The principal had a decision to make. What he, she asked in the letter, I want to come back to school. Can I come back? I will behave. I will get on track. I don't want to be pushed out of school. She, was, she acknowledged she was being pushed out. Through Getting her through the legal process was one thing, but also getting her back in school was another. Um, after the, the adjudication process ended, um, she was allowed back in school. And to get her back in school and back on track, we had a restorative circle, similar to what has already been described. Those, that student, the school principal, the teacher whom she berated in the hall, the resource officer, which was a first for us, we got the security officer in the circle, and a few other people in the circle to talk about what happened, why did it happen? How did it impact everyone in this room? And what can we do to move forward? What, what are we going to do to make this right? And the magic of that process was that not only did the student, again, take responsibility for her actions, commit to making it right, everyone around her had a story to tell, including the officer. He said, I see kids, I've been doing this work for a long time. I see kids get handcuffed and leave school and they never come back. And I see how it affects the dropout rate. I see them on the street years later as young adults. Nowhere to go, nothing to do. They continue to get in trouble. I really don't want that to happen for you. But for the first time in his career, he had been asked to address a student from that vein in the circle. He had never talked to a student before. In fact, he, had, he was so nervous about being in a circle, he had to follow the chain of command to get permission from his commander in order to sit in this, this um, conversation. The story ends in a great way. This student gets a lot of support from everyone in that circle, her principal, the teachers, everyone helped her get caught up in school, give her some one-on-one uh, -on -one academic support. She finishes that grade, goes to the next grade, which was her senior year. And now she's, uh, I think she's finishing her freshman year in college. Oh, she graduated with a 3.2, 3.3 grade point yes. average. Not because of anything unique that the DRC did, but because everyone in that school gave her an opportunity to be accountable and responsible for her behavior and to see herself beyond the incident that occurred in that hallway. 
uh, we removed the labels for her. She wasn't the bad girl, we can't stand to see her coming. She was a leader. As I said, in September, I saw her leadership skills. This young woman has been in the news for good things. Youth voice, getting rid of the suspensions, um, marching, going to Lansing, really being a voice uh, to change our educational disciplinary policies. I share that story because it is, it's an alarming story for me to see a young person arrested because they were mouthing off, <laughs> like teenagers don't mouth off. Um, but as of, what, 1990 or so, our zero tolerance policies entered school. It was designed to do a couple things to create a safe environment. Kids should not have weapons in school. But the leverage that that policy has given to administration is that we now have school systems that mimic the criminal justice system. The disciplinary policies of school is just what was, have been described already by uh, the previous speakers. Kids get in trouble because they make a bad choice. That choice might be due to many things. Poverty, um, the limits that they have in decision making, critical thinking skills are not there, and in most cases, their brains just aren't ready. They just don't know how to make critical decisions and think through things in a way that we as adults can. So they make a short-sighted, stupid decision. But the consequences that they suffer are long-lasting, and I do believe it contributes to this pipeline, uh, the, the school-to-prison pipeline. We've lost a lot of kids. They just disappear in school, and they're now in the criminal justice system. So that story was the start of us really being committed at the DRC to our work with kids in school. We continue to work with that school for an additional school year, and I just want to share a few things. In two school years, about 300 kids used our services. We were on site delivering services to them, restorative circles. It became very popular when kids will self-regulate and say, hey, I'm having a bad day, I need to circle up. I need to speak to my teacher in a protective, safe way because she's really getting on my nerves. Right or wrong, good or bad, they acknowledged that they were getting agitated. They acknowledged their need to get support in dealing with the conflict that was happening. We dealt with many things. Uh, this, this process deals with the usual things that you think of teens and schools fighting, relationship issues, cyberbullying, bullying, intimidation, all of those things showed up in our services at this particular school, at Ypsilanti High School. We also coach them through dealing with conflict because we know the conflict isn't going to go away. We just have to help them develop the, the tools and skills so they can manage it on their own. And in a restorative process, you get to do that with youth. Uh, so we, we've done that for a couple years, and I like to think that we've started building, helped them build the building blocks uh, for what they're able to continue today. This work is also present at Skyline. I need to wrap it up. Okay, um, it's also present at Skyline High School, and I'll just be really quick. About 30 students over school two, uh, two school years have been trained there. They are the facilitators for circles. They help their peers problem solve every single day. They have dealt with many usual things that you think of to some very complicated issues around racism. Um, and other isms, sexism, and such. These kids are able to do this work if they're given the tools and the opportunity to do so. And you will, at six o'clock, uh, Belinda Doolin will be leading a workshop here where you can see a demonstration, maybe participate in a, a restorative justice process. Um, next, we'll hear from Carolyn Madden, who is uh, another member of Friends of Restorative Justice. Hi. So this is the ACT part. You're going to be, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about court watching, uh, which is something that we've just decided to do on a bigger scale. So first, let me just ask, how many of you have been in a courtroom? Woo! Okay. <laughs> Um, so I don't know how you feel about that, whether it's intimidating or not intimidating. I, I'll tell you a short little story about my own experience recently. I've been a couple of times in courtrooms, but I went with my son in Chicago and we went to the immigration court because he wanted to see the court. He's trying to be an immigration lawyer. 
and we went, it's a much larger situation than it is here in Ann Arbor, and uh, at every step of the way, you felt like you were doing something wrong, even though we were there, he was trying to learn, I was just trying to observe and see what it looks like. When we got to the front door, they were not very nice to us. We got to the second door, why do we want to do this? And uh, finally we got in the court, and we had two different people come up to us, why are we there? Then the judge, had re uh, she had a little recess, and she asked my son, he explained he's a lawyer there, and I said, oh, I'm here for court watching. She said, well, no, we have official court watchers, and next to, over on the other side was a court watcher with a badge that said court watching. Well, that's what we want to do. We want to get official, and we want to have some uh, authority behind us as we do court watching. So what is court watching in this context, and uh, how do we do effective court watching, and uh, why is it so important to do right now? So um, in a week and a half, we have um, Fred Van Loo coming, and some of you may have already heard Fred Van Loo. He's been here twice before. And he's coming again. He's a retired prosecuting attorney, and he's nationally recognized authority on restorative justice and court watching. And Fred Van Loo says about court watching, we all have a stake in determining what criminal and juvenile justice should look like in our community. In order to effectively engage in dialogue with the decision makers within our justice system, it is necessary that we have a basic understanding of how the system is constructed how it operates, and what are its inadequacies and deficiencies. Court watching gives us a front row uh, seat at a pivotal point in the process. It gives us a foundation upon which to build our knowledge base. Court watching is a meaningful way to acquire the understanding and competence required to be effective advocates for justice. So by providing uh, training in court watching, we're hoping to build a cohort of volunteers, and that includes you, uh, who will increase public awareness of the justice system, acknowledging the exemplary actions as well as those actions that need attention. In the spirit of today's summit, Connect and Act, we hope that building this cohort, we can connect with the courts and act to inspire and make change in the judicial system. We want to understand the dilemmas and complexities of the system, and we want to use court watching observations through the use of standardized forms. We have forms that we will be working with and looking at, and statistical analysis of the data we collect to make informed recommendations to the justice system and to our elected officials. In researching court watching, as I was preparing for this, I see that you know there are very successful court watching programs in other parts of the world, of the country, and and the world actually. But um, Minneapolis, Minnesota has a program called Bringing an Eye to Justice. It has a newsletter, and it talks about the court watch's role in making the courts accountable and transparent. And in Cook County, Illinois, uh, there's reports online that you could look at um, with data from over 7,000 observ observations. Excuse me. They do it every two years. They do a report, and this is to influence the domestic violence court in Cook County. So every two years, the results are analyzed and put forward as recommendations to the court uh, court system for change and you can look down the list and you can see they highlight where it hasn't been changed and where there's been some change. So our hope is that we like Illinois can establish a volunteer network here where entered data can be analyzed and compiled for a presentation and a report and that it becomes a framework for influencing our legislators, our courts and affecting change in our justice system and the community as a whole. We have handouts that Nancy will give out. If there are not enough, we have a sign-up sheet if you want to be involved in the court watching training that's coming up in another week. Also, we're going to be training the trainers, so some of us will go out to the community and do some training also on court watching if you'd like to be involved in that. So handout, you have to register for that, and then you could also sign up. Okay, thank you. There, I think about the tough case play coming up at uh, two different churches and some books about restorative justice that you can purchase. Um, the next person to speak will be Mary King, who will talk another about another aspect of the current system, the prisoner reentry. Yes. 
So although we want to make sure that restorative justice practices are used primarily for diverting people out of the criminal justice system at the front end, there is some usefulness in a restorative justice model as people are preparing uh, for um, release from incarceration. There's, um, right now, when people come out, if they're on parole, they often have to pay victim fees or they have to pay restitution. I can tell you that that experience is way more about punishment than it is about restorative justice. People come out of prison, they have a very difficult time finding employment. There are lots of barriers. They often go back to very low income communities with low skills and sometimes uh, difficulty accessing education. And yet, they are required to pay sometimes exorbitant fees that don't necessarily go to the victim, by the way, and that the victim hasn't necessarily asked for. So this is another situation where the state has insinuated itself as the victim and is making decisions that people have to live with and live by without really engaging victims in those conversations. There have been some studies about using a restorative justice model for reentry, and they've come back very positive. Uh, it, that using restorative justice prior to reentry has reduced crime victims' post traumatic stress symptoms uh, and their desire for revenge. Both victims and the people who have caused the harm have feel more satisfaction with the criminal justice system overall, and that there's been a reduction in recidivism uh, when uh, people who've been incarcerated have participated. <laughs> I also have a call to action for today, and that is. I am part of a collaboration called the Michigan Collaboration to End Mass Incarceration. There are other people in this room who are part of that collaboration. It is an open group. We are looking for people who want to join us. We have a six-step process. We're interested in diverting more people out of the criminal justice system. and That's an area where restorative practices really needs to play a key role. We're also interested in reducing length of stay through sentencing reform. We're interested in improving the conditions of confinement so that when people are incarcerated, they actually can access skills and training and therapy and substance abuse treatment and mental health treatment so that they have a better chance when they come out. The fourth prong is prisoner reentry and making sure that that's a robust program that touches everyone, not the select few right now that are getting referred for prisoner reentry services. The fifth focus is public education because we know that for this population, stigma is very real. And stigma is the reason why people can't find housing, they can't find employment, and then we're shocked, shocked when they commit another crime to be able to support themselves. And the sixth tenet of, of the collaboration is that any savings that result because we have reduced the incarcerated population would get reinvested back into the communities that are most impacted by crime. Does that make sense to folks? Those are the six tenets. We have a resolution. I have a sign-up sheet here. The resolution is actually somewhat long because we have a lot of data in there. But if you sign up on this sheet here, I will send you, email you a copy of the resolution and the guidelines for the collaboration and I hope that you will join us. Thank you. Lastly, we'll hear from Reverend uh, Joe Summers from the Church of the Incarnation. So, I want to talk about restorative justice as a key means of helping to end mass incarceration. And I just want to begin by reminding us that our justice system has now created, uh, through the enormous number of people charged and convicted with felonies, has created a second class of citizens in this country for whom it's legally, uh, it's legal to discriminate against them in terms of employment, in terms of housing, in terms of their citizenship rights with things like voting and jury selection. Um, I think we'll see that mass incarceration has been one of the great evils of our time. And our hope is uh, part of what we're trying to do, part of what we're looking for help in is how to set up a county-based restorative justice system as a way to get, Washtenaw County's been equally contributing to mass incarceration as every other county in this state. 
and how we can uh, bring an end to that. Uh, um, and it's important to say that in this effort, we're not starting from ground zero. We have quite a few, I mean, the dispute resolution centers work is a marvelous example of restorative justice practices that are helping to break the school to prison pipeline. When it comes to minor crimes, we, on the district court level, we have a variety of different kinds of restorative justice practices in terms of things like the veterans court, uh, the drug and alcohol court, the mental health court. But when you get to the more serious level of crimes, nothing exists. So our judges don't have, basically it's incarceration or nothing. Uh, and what the public doesn't understand is that in fact it's often people who have committed the most serious crimes who are least likely to ever commit more crimes in the future. Just statistically you can look at this, it may seem paradoxical because it goes against all the propaganda we get in through our movies and stuff. Um, and what we need to do is create the resources, create the expectations for our judges to begin to place people into community programs when that would be more appropriate than being incarcerated. By the way, I'll just simply say, people need to understand what incarceration means. You know, incarceration generally takes people who've had a hard time becoming a successful part of society and then makes it almost impossible for them uh, after you've been convicted uh, and gone through the traumatizing experience of incarceration, the demeaning experience, and then all the barriers of discrimination that you face when you have a felony conviction. Um, for this, and by the way, community programs, you know, if you have community programs that judges can, can people can go to, judges can actually just suspend their sentences until they see whether they're successful in those programs. If they're not successful, then you've got the alternative of incarcerating them. But it gives people this chance. We also, that's the change on the court level we're needing. In terms of the prosecutor's office, we need a whole new kind of prosecuting office in Washtenaw County. By statutes, prosecutors have the jurisdiction to determine who should be charged with what crimes. Currently, one of the main drivers of mass incarceration is that where in the past, one out of three people arrested were charged with felony convictions uh, 20, 30 years ago. Now, two out of three are facing felony charges. In our juvenile system, prosecutors do a reviewing to see who they want to really charge with crimes. Uh, and you'll find so many youth are never charged if they figure there's a good alternative or this would not be helpful. We have no counterpart to that in the adult system. Basically, our prosecutors go for charging people with the highest sentence possible. Actually, they have a system where they charge you with even more crimes, so you'll plead down to whatever they, one more minute, I'm gonna have to tell you. that'll be 447, so I don't think I have questions. I thought I got until, okay, 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 so, okay. <laughs> so, um, we need, um, uh, we need to create, you know, we give, we respect the dignity and the worth of youth in such a way that we're looking to give them a chance to be a successful part of society. We need to change our attitudes towards adults. Um, we also need to make sure, as Mary said, that the savings that, um, that comes from not incarcerating people, you know, it costs more to incarcerate somebody than it does to send them to a, a fancy elite college. Um, so the fact that we have more young black men of college age in Michigan's prisons than we have going to college says where we're putting our resources. Um, so we do need to make sure that as we create these diversion programs, the county uh, receives the benefits of that. And that can be done through a system where the state uh, gives counties a certain per capita allocation for you know, how you're going to spend your money, either on community programs or incarceration but the county would get that money. Um, lastly, two, two quick things. We need to watch against the mentality of the lock em up folks, which include many liberals, who want to say, yes, we want to do restorative justice practices, but what it's really about is extending control over more groups of people for more minor crimes. We need to insist that re restorative justice be about diverting people out of prison and keeping people from being charged with prison. We want to get back to, I believe it was 
years ago, 1972, Michigan had 13,000 people incarcerated, something like that, same size population. Right now we have a prison system of 43,000 people. When we get back to those numbers, we'll have you know, achieved our goal, and that's gonna require uh, just significant changes at all different levels. Um, okay, I guess those are most of the main things. But anyway, so restorative justice, key way for us locally to begin to act to bring an end to mass incarceration. So, so we're going to begin a campaign to push our county commissioners to commit our county towards moving towards a restorative justice system. So it's beginning to open up that conversation. Lots of people are, I find even lawyers are the most confused about what we're talking about with restorative. It's such a restorative justice. It's such a different system. We're kind of starting from ground zero to educate people. I think the concepts are so clear in terms of the benefits for the community and the county. I think people can be won over, but it's going to take a real mass education campaign. Yes, Joe, my, my question is kind of twofold. Number one, how uh, do you have a, a sign-up sheet for individuals who may want to participate in the veteran uh, watch? Uh, I would, okay. As you know, I... The Veterans the Court is a Veterans local court. court in our county, okay. Washtenaw County. How do we get involved? Because you know I'm a retired U.S. Navy chaplain, so I'm very interested in Veterans Court. We could, um, we can try to put you in touch with our local Veterans That'll Court, work. and you Thank can hear about it. Sherry, with the um, group that's um, working for ends of mass incarceration, are you working both at the jail and prison level, or are you focusing more on one than the other? I'm sorry. Uh, okay. We, we need to focus on both the jails and the prisons, but part of what's happened is that we've, again, we're sending people with minor crimes to the jails. If we're going to empty out the prisons, some of those folks should be coming down into the jails, and people who are currently in the jails really should be in community programs, and people who are currently putting in community programs probably should just not be under any program at all. Uh, something like a third of people who commit crimes, once they get caught, that's it. They're never going to commit another crime. And those folks shouldn't even be in the system at all. Yeah. I don't know how much emphasis should be placed on the 13th Amendment based on the hardcore conditions of prison, but it says no slavery or involuntary service shall exist within the United States unless convicted. So that means once convicted, all of the atrocities of slavery can be heaped upon people. So it's right. a fundamental law that needs to be changed, and I don't know what ratification needs to take place. So one, one of the key things in this is that we need to be pressing for international human rights law okay. to become encoded in our national law. Right. Um, the U.S. Constitution was one of the leading human rights documents of its time. Mm -hmm. Right now, the United States has about the lowest rate of human rights protections legally encoded in, in, in our legal system of almost any country. So that would be one way to approach that. Do you all want to get it? Anybody else questions? I'll say talk to your county commissioners, because that's where we're working. That's that one for both the jail and for Esper Restorative Justice. Join our efforts. We've got, you know, we're only going to make a difference by, by getting organized. We've got the sign-up sheets over here. We've got real, uh, the organization Mary's running is leading this statewide campaign. This is a critical time to make a difference. Ferguson has got this on people's minds, and we've got the same issues going on around our state. We need to address them. And I just want to say, to Joe's point, the time is now. I mean, you have people who are very, very conservative politically, people who are very liberal politically, and people who are in the middle. And there is a universal agreement that our criminal justice system is broken, and it needs to be repaired. So the time is now. If you're interested, come and join us, please. Thank you all for coming. Uh